Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for all Thy manifold blessings to us, all of which come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for Thy Word, which is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of Thy glory with exceeding joy. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us an understanding that we might know him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. We thank Thee that Thou hast given us this one day, out of seven, to set it apart, that Thou first hast set it apart unto Thy service and unto the benefit of Thy people. We pray, therefore, that Thou hast bless Thy people this day through the proclamation of Thy Word, cause us to understand and believe, open our Open thou our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. We pray for thy church. We pray that thou wilt continue to raise up men to stand for the truth and against the lie. We realize how serious this apostasy is without which intervention on high the church is going to disappear, but we know that the gates of hell shall not, uh, in the words of our Lord, prevail against thy church. So we pray unto that end. We pray that thou wouldst continue to protect, support, deliver thy church. And we pray that thy word would go forth, not only in this place, but throughout all the earth, even this day that we know that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then, and then only, shall the end come. So we pray that thou wilt be with us, enlighten us, cause us to understand and believe. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray, amen. We are, well, I intended to continue to look at verse 30 today, but circumstances have determined otherwise, uh, I've decided to go back and review a specific point in Hebrews 11, which uh, recent circumstances have confirmed the necessity of which. So we're going to read uh, Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 7 by way of review. Now, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaking. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And so, we see that um, this, the importance of this two-word phrase, as we saw last week, by faith, by faith, by faith. So we want to clarify something that is of an extreme importance, especially uh, in this age in which we live and what we see happening around us. It is a result of our not paying attention to this point of the text, especially in verse 7. We frequently use these two words together. 
The covenant, the covenant, the covenant, the covenant. What is the covenant? What is the importance of the covenant? Unless we clarify this, I will be talking to myself and remain talking to myself. So this has to be understood. This doctrine of the covenant, which we see, as I hope to show, in verse 7 of our text. Let me read it again. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous. This is very interesting. We're not going to go into the verse in any depth. But did you notice that? By which he condemned the world. Once again, the antithesis is the thing that condemns the world. Because it is the exact opposite of the way the world thinks. And this doctrine of the covenant is the exact opposite of the way the world thinks. The way the church is thinking at present. So, we started back. The first personage that we dealt with in Hebrews 11, as we just saw, was Abel. By faith, Abel. And this teaches us the doctrine of justification. Abel's sacrifice was a blood sacrifice, as you recall. That's why it was, remember that. Don't ever forget that. That's why Abel, it wasn't only Abel's sacrifice that was received. It was Abel himself. And he was received owing to this blood sacrifice, as we hope to see in a few minutes. The importance of this. Importance of the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. I'm not sure how much that hymn writer understood the importance of the blood. Hebrews 10 4 says, let's look at that. A page back. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, the importance of the blood, and yet, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. By faith, Abel offered a sacrifice, some sort of animal sacrifice, which sacrifice could not possibly, according to Hebrews 10, 4, take away sins. But his sins were taken away because his sacrifice was an admiration, a foreshadowing, a looking towards the one sacrifice, which is the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, which propitiated not only for Abel, but for all of God's people, propitiated God's wrath with respect to his people, so by faith, Abel was justified. And justification is an act. Let's, let's look at Abel with respect to this definition of justification. I know of no better definition. I've challenged other people to come up with one. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins. So let's take Abel. Act of God's free grace wherein Abel's sins were pardoned. And Abel was accepted as righteous in the sight of God only for the righteousness of Christ which was imputed to Abel and it was received by faith alone. His sacrifice, he had some kind of understanding that this sacrifice was a sacrifice looking forward to the Messiah which was to come. And he was delivered, as we have said time and time again, from the state under which Adam fell, the state of the guilt of sin. So Abel, uh, Abel is a picture of justification. Notice the order in the text. That's what we want to see today. First of all, you, and as we've said over and over again, Hebrews 11 is talking about you. By faith, by faith, by faith. You have the faith 
of Abel. You have the faith, secondly, of Enoch. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased him. Isn't it interesting? He just popped up into my head. This word translation and a transfiguration. This is a picture, as we said, that Christ was transfigured on the mount. And we said, this is a perfect picture of sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification is a process, as we're going to see in a few minutes. But sanctification is the idea that what had been previously true of Christ, yet not apparent outwardly, true of him inwardly, not apparent outwardly, became more and more apparent on the mount as he was transfigured before the apostles. And such is the case of the Christian. We're justified, and once we're justified, we immediately begin to be sanctified. Sanctification is an outward display of an inward condition, exactly what we are. More and more. It is apparent outwardly, at least to the people of God, what we are through justification inwardly. And so we're told um, in Genesis 5, tells us, uh, verse 5 of Hebrews 11 tells us that Enoch was... Um, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then Genesis 5, which speaks of Enoch, tells us the reason why Enoch pleased God. The, re the reason Enoch pleased God is that he walked with God. And walking is a picture of sanctification. Walking is a picture of uh, direction. When you see someone walking with a purpose, he has direction. And walking is a picture of Probably most importantly, progress. He's progressing along the road as he's walking. And so, Enoch is a picture of sanctification. Abel is a picture of justification. Note the order once again. We're justified. And then we're sanctified. By faith we're justified. By faith we're sanctified. By faith Enoch was sanctified. Um, and let's... Briefly, let's compare justification with sanctification as this is so necessary to the Christian life. We said that you cannot, in an absolute sense, you cannot separate justification from sanctification. But for the sake of understanding, we can separate the two and distinguish between the two. Justification, first of all, is an objective act. God is, it is an objective declaration on the part of God. Justification is an act of God's free grace, whereas sanctification is subjective. Justification, we could say, is something happens that happens objectively to you. Sanctification is something subjectively which happens in you. Justification, you, you are declared to be something that you hitherto were not. Sanctification means you are something subjectively, which you were not. You are something. The Christian, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. We talk to ourselves and we tell ourselves, I am something. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. I'm something that never existed before through regeneration. Secondly, justification is punctiliar, meaning it happens at a point in time. Sanctification, however, is not punctiliar. Sanctification is a process. Thirdly, justification is a declaration of God concerning the Christian. 
Sanctification is not a declaration, but a work of God. Justification is an act of God's free grace. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. Fourthly, justification has to do with the guilt of sin. We said Adam fell into two states. He fell under the guilt of sin, whereas sanctification deals with the fact that Adam fell under the dominion of sin. Fifthly, justification has to do with imputation of righteousness. Sanctification has to do with impartation of righteousness. We are subjectively righteous more and more in sanctification. We said before that sanctification is basically the idea that <clears throat> what we are. Once again, what did we say? The Mount of Transfiguration, what he was inwardly, what he was objectively became more and more apparent subjectively, outwardly, which is the state of the Christian. Impartation of righteousness. Sanctification is the process by which we subjectively catch up, as it were, to what we were at justification, objectively. And then lastly, justification is past tense salvation and sanctification is present continuous tense. Last week we used once again Exodus eleven seven that thou mayest know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel with emphasis on the word how. How is it that God made a difference between the Egyptians and Israel? And the answer is the blood placed over the doorpost. And such is the case today. God still puts a difference between the Egyptians, between the reprobate and the elect through the blood over the doorpost, but not merely. Notice carefully that statement, how important that is, that thou mayest know how that the Lord doth it put a difference by the blood, as we just said in justification. But then, that thou mayest know, that thou mayest know how that the Lord doth put a difference. Salvation is knowing that the blood, the blood of Christ and the blood of Christ alone is that which maketh the difference between the elect and the reprobate. Which is to say, understanding and believing in limited atonement. That's salvation. There's no person, we have to get this cemented in our minds, there is no person who is a Christian who does not believe in limited atonement because limited atonement simply says this, it's the blood of Christ that makes a difference. The false gospel says Christ did just as much for those in hell as for those who make it to heaven, which means what? The blood of Christ does not make the difference. That's salvation. So by faith, Abel, dealing with the guilt of sin. By faith, Enoch, dealing with the dominion of sin, which is the second state under which Adam fell. Objective state of guilt, subjective state of dominion. Which we said, we got to Hebrews 11 through Isaiah 52, 7, saying to Zion, thy God reigneth. God reigns by his law. And God reigns by his law in justification causing us to come face to face with his law and to realize that we are something other than what God demands us to be. You see that, how that relates to God's reigning by his law. He insists on his law. And then secondly, God reigns by his law. Enoch tells us in sanctification because he delivers us and is delivering us more and more. As we said, sanctification is a process. From the dominion of sin, the power 
and pollution of sin. And Enoch is a perfect picture of this subjective deliverance. The import of walking, as we just said, is the fact that we are progressing. That's why we call it progressive sanctification. There is a type of sanctification which is positional. But for the most part, when we mention sanctification, we're talking about this process. This walking. And this walking is otherwise known as obedience. So the Christian progresses in obedience. And the Christian must progress in obedience when we realize that we, that, that, that the path of the just, didn't we mention this yesterday, Proverbs 4.18, the path of the just is as the shining light. Once again, this metaphor in creation, serving redemption, the path of the just is as the sun, the shining light, which shineth more and more, begins in the morning, sunrise. Sunrise is regeneration. The light is understanding. We began to understand. We, didn't, we understood nothing, as Hebrews 4, 17 and 18 tells us. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Once you're no longer alienated from the life of God, guess what you have? You have life. Through the ignorance that is in them. Once you're enlightened, you're no more ignorant. And the path of the justice as a shining light, which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. This understanding. Meditate on the fact. Rejoice in the fact. Be encouraged by the fact that you think of how much more you understand now than you did a year ago. That's sanctification. Because there is no separation from, what do we say? The mind, the affections, and the will. There's no separation from these three. The more you understand by the grace of God, the more it affects you, and the more it is demonstrated subjectively in your life. More and more unto the perfect day. The perfect day is glorification. And so in justification... What happens to you in justification? Something objectively happens to you. You are considered perfect in the sight of God. Through faith. In Christ. And we said that justification is God's demanding. Think about this. Meditate on this until the day you die. Justification is God's commanding you. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth through his law. Justification is God saying to you, be what you are not. That is the essence of terror. Think about that. Be something objectively which you are not. God demands something of you of which you have nothing and which you cannot produce. Justification. Be what you are not. Deliverance from the guilt of sin. What is God's demand in his law in sanctification? Is it not be what you are? I was reading one of our favorite authors, Thomas Watson. I can't remember what work it was, but he made this statement that the two most difficult, I believe it, yeah, I'm sure it was Watson, the two most difficult things I've found in life as a pastor is to make the wicked sad. Think about this. To make the wicked sad and the second most difficult thing is to make the righteous joyful. See that? God makes you sad, bluer than blue, sadder than sad. He makes you sadder than sad in demanding something of which you have nothing. Be what you are not. Secondly, sanctification. Be what you are. To make the righteous joyful. That's how he makes you to be. What you are. Justification by faith. Abel. Sanctification by faith. Enoch. 
And then we get to verse 7. By faith, Noah, being as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Notice also that Noah, meditate on this, Abel, picture of justification, Enoch, picture of sanctification, Noah, picture of justification and sanctification. By faith, Noah moved with fear. What is fear? The essence of fear is what we were just speaking of. Realization that God demands something of you. Something from you of which you have nothing. Moved by fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. You might be thinking, wait a second, Noah's house was destroyed in the flood. <laughs> This house, which was made of wood, probably. But we're not talking about wood. We're not talking about three bedrooms and two baths. He moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Proverbs 3, let's look at this. Proverbs 3, 33. Somebody's got this verse underlined. <laughs> Two, I believe. Proverbs 3, 33. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blessed the habitation of the just. We're talking about people here. Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, to the saving of his family. Notice the progression. Abel, justification. Enoch, sanctification. And by faith, Noah teaches us something else. How the progression works. Justification is a realization that you are every bit as evil as you can possibly. You are the opposite of what God demands you to be. Sanctification, realization, understanding more and more. As we see, don't you see more and more this most important religious question? We're seeing it everywhere, aren't we? Realization, sanctification. Just as we said, the saving of his house isn't a physical house, but it's people. But it's not people that you see at the football game with a loudspeaker. Or people that you see in the workplace. Noah's house consisted of people which came from his loins. His three sons and their daughters. So God is speaking to us in verse 7. In verse 4, he's speaking to us of the doctrine of justification. Verse 5, the doctrine of sanctification. And this progress unto the doctrine of the covenant. In a few minutes, we're going to speak of the verse, the covenantal verse. Noah is an introduction of this. Noah built a house to the saving, Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. And every Christian head of household does exactly the same thing. He prepares an ark. To the saving of his house. And we can't speak of, as we just said, Noah's house emanated, came from, originated out of his loins. And we can speak of loins in, a, in an appropriate way, with propriety as it were. Um, parents, not only Christian parents, but think about this. Pagan parents even say to their children, now Johnny, don't let anyone touch your private parts. Right? Even pagan parents tell them, especially in this age. And what is meant by that? Is, is he talking about his feet or his hands? 
Everybody knows what he's talking about. But here's the question. How did these parts become private parts, which almost nobody even considers? Certainly not the infidel. I was listening to a... To a uh, A person be, being interviewed, a comedian being interviewed, and he was asked by this con conservative commentator, why is it that you constantly throw out these F-bombs? It isn't good for the kids, is it? To which the comedian responded, this is spice for my stew, the F-bombs. But could this comedian tell us, why is it spice? Here's the reason. The reason is he's speaking publicly of private things. Noah, we're told, um, in Genesis verse, excuse me, Genesis chapter six, verse eight. We're concentrating on Noah. Today in the progress from justification to sanctification to this concept of the covenant. But Noah. Well, let's start with verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me. Imagine the rain it would have taken to destroy the fowl of the air. It repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What does that mean? Did Noah find grace because he was looking for it? Impossible. Because if Noah found grace because he was looking for it, that would be justification by works. Which reminds me. Of another passage. What does it mean when it says that Noah found grace? Remember Isaiah 65. We're not going to be looking at that verse. But think of it. It just popped up into my head. I am found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. That's what we're talking about. When we say Noah found grace. John 1.12. But it's been, everybody, you know, if, if you, in case you haven't uh, re-listened to that sermon, go back. I think it's entitled uh, Arminian Verses, but you might want to go back and listen to that passage because it's significant in this respect. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But we infrequently, at least from most sermons that we hear, it is not frequently pointed out the context. He was in the world. John 1, 12. Christ was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Christ was in the world and the world knew him not. The world was made by him. And the world knew him not. No exceptions. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. No exceptions. But as many as received him. How could this not be a contradiction? Here's how it could not be a contradiction. Because of the same concept of Noah finding grace. Noah found grace. It reminds me of um, the, uh, remember when, uh, we've heard this a lot of times. I've heard it tons of times. Salvation consists in one beggar. Telling another beggar where to find bread. And once the second beggar finds out where the bread is, he reaches out and he grabs him a loaf or a slice. Which is not the idea inculcated in John 1, 12, according to the context. He was in the world. world knew him not. No exceptions. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. No exceptions, but as many as received him. No contradiction. Here's why there's no contradiction. The protester received a blow to the head. You see it? Did he reach out and receive something? 
No, he received it passively. But as many as received him, meaning as many to whom he was given. Noah found grace in the sight of God because God gave him grace. He was a recipient of grace. And so it is with salvation. Noah found grace because grace was given to him by God. Noah found grace moved with fear. That's justification. He realized that God demanded of him something of which he was not able to produce. And that's Noah's justification. What's Noah's sanctification? He prepared. He worked. It's activity. What did we say last week? The Christian life is a life of activity, and yet it is an activity. We reviewed that yesterday, didn't we? The first instance was Lazarus. Did Lazarus come out of the grave? Yes. Did Lazarus come out of the grave because he was called? Yes. But it was in such a way, that activity was performed in such a way that he would never take credit for it. And so, Naaman the Syrian washed and became non-leprous. And then the man with a withered hand, same thing. So Noah prepared an ark because he was commanded to, which is his sanctification, his obedience to God. And we've been speaking of, on Fridays, obedience consists in obedience to the Decalogue. Westminster Shorter Catechism, question three. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach, as we said yesterday, principally for the most part, foundationally. What is the message of the scripture? We're told in question three. What man is to believe concerning God? Which is justification. Secondly, what is the duty which God requires of man? Which is sanctification. And that's how Noah acted. He was moved by fear and he prepared something. What was it that he prepared? He prepared an ark. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the ark. Is it not? By faith Noah was justified. By faith Noah was sanctified. And to build an ark, meditate on this. To build an ark, as we said, Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about you. You build an ark as the head of a household. And the building of this ark, as Luther reminds us again and again and again, takes place up here. You build an ark of understanding. The understanding of the ark. Sanctification. This greater and greater, greater and increasingly. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more. That takes place in your mind. The ark. First of all, Preparing an ark speaks of the wrath of God. It was delivered from wrath. Which is the speaking. Secondly, first of all, the ark speaks of wrath. Notice that this is the gospel. Secondly, the ark speaks of the determination of the Father to save his people. Unconditional election. Thirdly, the ark represents 1 Corinthians 1.10. Excuse me, 1 Thessalonians. Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivereth us from the wrath to come. 
Firstly, the ark speaks of wrath. Secondly, the determination of the Father in election to, dis- to save a people. Thirdly, the ark represents deliverance from this wrath. Even Jesus, which delivereth us from the wrath to come. The ark was Christ. And as we've been recently saying, we are saved from wrath, by wrath. Fourthly, we are delivered by understanding the Father's election, determination to deliver us from wrath. Secondly, we're saved by understanding the work of the Son and then the work of the Spirit, enlightening us in the knowledge of Christ. And as we said last week from Exodus 11, 7, this building, excuse me, not Exodus 11, 7, this week, uh, Hebrews eleven seven. 7, Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his household, as we just said. It takes place in the, in the mind. Isaiah 28, 10, let's look at that once again. We've looked at this quite a few times recently. Isaiah 28, 10, I hope somebody will memorize it. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Which means that we don't just teach anyone, but we teach our progeny and meditate on this, how we've been deceived I think of my background. Deceived into thinking that God's people are produced primarily through personal evangelism or crusade evangelism, even. Have you ever noticed how difficult it is not only to convince someone to believe in Jesus Christ, but to to communicate with them? A stranger. You meet on a bus. You meet in the marketplace, in the grocery store, on the street, wherever, at an athletic event. How difficult it is for them to even understand what you're saying. But this is the way that God builds his people, precept upon precept to our progeny, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, and there a little. Then we come to Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. We said that verse 23 doesn't speak of Moses' faith, but Moses' parents' faith. And Moses' parents' faith caused them not to fear. God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Verse 24 tells us, verse 24 does speak of Moses' faith. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We said this is an instance of Moses' parents' faith becoming his faith. Verse 27 proves it. Verse 23 when he was born, he was here three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. He was a covenant child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Verse 27, Moses, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. There it is. Moses' faith became his, excuse me, Moses' parents' faith became his faith. And back to the concept of house. Noah preparing an ark to the saving of his house. We said that house indicates his progeny, which is tied to last week. Last week's message, we said that we spoke of the militant nature of faith. The concept of Jericho, as we just said. The fight of the Christian. Fight the good fight of faith. The militant nature of faith. 
The church on earth is called the church militant. The church in heaven is called the church triumphant. And meditate on that. You, you don't triumph unless you fight. Triumphant, see, conquering is a result of fighting. And we can clear up another misconception here. I don't know how many times you've heard this, but I've heard it tens of times. No cross, no crown. <laughs> no cross. In other words, if you don't take up that cross, then you're not going to get a crown. That's justification by works. But the militancy of the Christian, as we just pointed out, takes place in such a way that God shows you. You can take no credit for it. It's not justification by works. Moses found grace. Excuse me. Noah found grace. But as many as received him, as many to whom Christ is given, So, once again, the concept. It is not that you should fight. Get this in your heads. It's not that you should fight. It's the fact that you do fight by the grace of God. And you conquer. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, another passage, which is related to this Jericho passage. How does a Christian fight? This fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Faith is understanding which leads to our justification. Faith is understanding which leads to our sanctification. Justification by faith. Sanctification by faith. And now, in the person of Noah, we're speaking of covenantal faith. Psalm 127. Don't hear this passage very much. You ought to know where I'm going. Psalm 127. Beginning with verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. So, this militant faith. Children are called here, what? You don't hear this mentioned very often. You hear, you, 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 you hear this passage quoted. Children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As there is in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. But verse 4, children are referred to as arrows. Not talking about dress shirts. We're talking about weapons. What else does an arrow indicate? Children are weapons. Have you ever heard of an army that thought that they had too many weapons? Never heard of it. Inconceivable. And now, let's look at the covenantal verse. The verse of the covenant. Genesis 17.7. 7. Somebody just mentioned it. The covenantal verse. Genesis 17.7. 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. And thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. The statement of the covenant. What does he mention twice here? I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and thy seed after thee. Sanctification, first of all, what does this teach us? Sanctification, is, excuse me, salvation is not individualistic. Me and thee and thy seed after thee. 
Salvation is not individualistic, but it's covenantal. In other words, have you heard this statement? We've mentioned it before. This Baptist statement. I heard it first. Here's how serious the situation is in which we live. I heard it first of all from a Presbyterian. God has no grandchildren. Hey, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Last time I checked, Jacob was a grandchild. Me and thee and thy seed after thee. Secondly, not only is salvation covenantal, but salvation is not conditional. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and I seed after thee. Thirdly, salvation is unilateral and not bilateral. You have nothing whatsoever to do. You are saved. You find grace. In the sight of God. Not because you're looking for it. But because God granted it to you. Lunar, unilateral and not bilateral. Verse 8 says. And I will give unto thee. And to thy seed after thee the land. Spiritually speaking. Which is heaven. And then in verse 10. This my covenant. Which ye shall keep. Which ye shall keep. Not which I hope you will keep. Which ye shall keep between me and you. And thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Notice. This, is, this jumped off the page at me for the first time ever. Let's read it again. This is my covenant. Which ye shall keep. Between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. God says, my covenant is circumcision. Notice he doesn't say that circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Though it is. He says, circumcision is the covenant. In other words, you shall have seed. And it shall be seed of circumcision. That's what he's saying. Back to the concept of private parts. Why are they private parts? Because they're circumcised parts. Because God's seed is a covenantal seed. God's people are covenantal people. God's people are set apart through circumcision. This is the holiness of God's seed. And then back to chapter 12. This is chapter 17. God says in chapter 12 at the beginning of his declarations to Abraham. In thee shall all the families of the earth. Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his family. In thee shall the families, all the families of the earth be blessed. And since Malachi 3.6 tells us. I am the Lord, I change not. This is the way God produces His people. Think once again. I want you to get this in your head. How difficult. It, a great multitude. What is it? Revelation 7, 9, which no man can number. Out of every nation and kindred and people and tribe. Stood before the throne. And before, which no man can number. How is this going to be to be brought about? Not through personal evangelism. You should know that yourself. This is the way that God saves his people. In the line of continued generations. Noah prepared an ark. To the saving of his household. And once again. His household was the church. The church must be instructed. And the church comes from. The households of God's people. The only change. I'm the Lord I change not. We're not Baptists. Baptists believe there's a, uh, there's a change. We don't believe in the Old Testament. We believe in the New Testament. The New Covenant. As we've said time and time again. The New Covenant is not something that never existed before. The New Covenant is substance as opposed to shadow. 
The only change that has transpired is found in Romans chapter 11, verse 17. Nothing has changed in the way that God saves His people. Romans eleven seventeen, And if some of the branches be broken off, that's Israel, and thou, being a wild olive tree, the Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. We are the circumcision. No, we're not dispensationalists. We are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. God's method of salvation, once the Gentiles come in, it's the same. Now, you are the head of your household and I save my people the way I saved my people in the Old Testament. I save them in the New Testament the same way. Westminster Shorter Catechism. Question 95. Listen carefully to this. To whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church till they profess their faith in Christ in obedience to Him. To any that are out of the visible church, baptism takes place in the visible. Meditate on this. Takes place in the visible Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church. You understand this? How is the visible church produced? Through the line of continued generations. That's why we baptize our children because baptism is now the sign of the covenant. This is why these parts are called private parts. This is holy activity. The production of God's people. 1 Peter 2.9 Let's start with verse 8. A stone of stumbling to the reprobate. Christ is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word, the reprobate, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. There it is. You're a holy nation because God produces you through this holy act. Circumcised act. The world doesn't understand, but we understand this concept of private parts. The world, in fact, uses this activity. Think about that. The world uses this activity and separates it from conception. Does it not? How many people have I mean, here's how ignorant we are. Can you separate planned parenthood, secular planned parenthood, from Christian planned parenthood? The world separates this activity from conception. Not so the Christian. Because this is holy activity. This is the way that God's people are produced. So, since this is the way God produces His people, secondly, since Genesis 1.28, God said to Adam and Eve, and God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Thirdly, since arrows are military equipment, armaments, our children, number one, we desire children. 
Since God saves his people in the line of continued generations, this is the way. Do we know when it's going to happen? No. Do we know that it's going to happen? Yes. God is going to multiply his people. So number one, we desire children. Secondly, we take no active steps to avoid these arrows, these weapons, which are children, which children are predicated to be. Thirdly, we pray and ask God to grant us these weapons. And so the ridiculous nature, this is why we're preaching this message today, the ridiculous nature of this statement, let me quote it again. We want to pray for those Christian families who desire more children. Do you see the ridiculous nature of that statement? We want to pray for Christian families who desire more children. That's akin to saying we want to pray that there would, that, that, that there would be more Christians in this country. How ludicrous. The Lord's Prayer. Yes, this is found in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, the first and second petitions. What's the first petition? That God would enable. Hallowed be. What is the first petition in the Lord's Prayer? Hallowed be thy name. That God would enable us and others to glorify him in all that whereby making himself known. And that he would dispose all things to his own glory. Secondly, that Satan's kingdom may, may be destroyed. And that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. Ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it. How is the kingdom of grace advanced? That's what we're talking about. What is the strongest, all of you men out there, what is the strongest physical desire of a man? What is it? What is a desire for? It is a desire for children. That's the only logical thing it can be a desire for. If you're a normal person, which is to say, the strongest desire of a man, spiritually speaking, is thy kingdom come. That's what that desire is telling you. Now, well, let me clarify something because somebody brought this up. Excellent question. Are there people who are true Christians and don't understand this concept that the Christian does not take active steps to avoid God's blessing of arrows, of weapons, of children. Let me ask you this question. Is it possible for a Christian, for a person to be a Christian and not know that Saul was the first king of Israel? Of course it's possible. But after he's told that Saul was the first king of Israel. What does he believe? He believes that Saul was the first king of Israel. Likewise, once you become a Christian, think about this. Most of you have only recently become Christians. How long did it take you to understand this concept of the covenant? Didn't take you long, did it? What's my point? Yes, it's possible for a person to be a Christian and not understand this concept, but it doesn't take him long. Because a Christian is a person who zealously wants to understand. Wants to understand something. He wants to understand justification by the grace of God. He wants to understand sanctification. He's objectively something that he wasn't before. God declares you as perfect. Secondly, he causes you subjectively to be more and more and more conformed to the image of Christ. How is it that God's people are produced that's our desire. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? He wants to know. And he discovers it very quickly. And so lastly, we want to review one more time the importance, the all importance of this concept. Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his household. And so do you. So does every covenant head. He prepares an ark. He prepares understanding. 
the understanding of his children. Genesis 1.28. This is how prevalent this idea is in Scripture. And how we've all but forgotten it. And God bless them as we just read this one. And said unto them, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 9.1. Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Command of God. Never rescinded to this day. Six verses later, he says to Noah again, and you, be ye fruitful and multiply after the flood. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Genesis 17 to God to Abraham. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Genesis 22, 17 to Abraham again. That in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying and in, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. God to Isaac. Genesis 26, 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Genesis 26, 24. Again to Isaac. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed. There is no blessing apart from multiplication. I hope you're able to turn to these passages quickly enough. God says to Jacob in Genesis 35, 11, Abraham, first of all, Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Noah, be fruitful and multiply. Abraham, be fruitful and multiply. Isaac, be fruitful and multiply. I will multiply thee to Jacob. Genesis 35, 11, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. Do you look forward? I look forward to this. We're going to be a part of it by the grace of God. Genesis 48, 4. Jacob speaking to Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now Jacob to Joseph, his son. He said that God appeared to him. Jacob says that God appeared to me and he said this. He said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee. I will multiply thee. And I will make of thee a multitude of people. And will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Exodus 32, the verse 13. Moses Speaking to God, reminding God of the covenant. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. Leviticus 26, 9. God speaking to Israel, for I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. Deuteronomy 7.13 And he will love thee once again to Israel and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy... Notice this. God not only will multiply his people but he will bless the fruit. This is what we are to pray for. To pray to this, this end. Not only that God would grant us a seed but he would bless those Arrows he gives to us. Deuteronomy 8.1 And all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply. There's no living without multiplication. The church is dying out. Haven't you noticed that? Because the church is now multiplying. Deuteronomy 13.17 And there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger. And show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee. Multiplication is God's having compassion on his people. Deuteronomy 28, 63. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good 
and to multiply. God doesn't do you good unless He multiplies you. Deuteronomy 35. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it. We're speaking spiritually. We possess heaven through this multiplication. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Deuteronomy 30, 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. The purpose of keeping God's commandments is so that we will multiply. Thy kingdom come. Jeremiah 30, permeating the entire Old Testament. 30 verse 19, And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. That's the glory of God's people. This glory of multiplication. Thanksgiving. And the voice of them that make merry. Jeremiah 33, 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered. Notice, speaking of another metaphor, right? The stars. What do the stars represent? God said, look up to Abraham. Remember that? What do you see? Stars without number. That is your progeny. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David. Ezekiel 36.10 And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and this city shall be inhabited. Ezekiel 36.11 And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit and I will settle you after your old estates, and I will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am... The you know that God is God through multiplication. He's produced it. Ezekiel 36. You can't have it. In other words, this is what a lot of people say. As soon as you emphasize this aspect of God's producing His people in the line of continuing, are we to have as many kids as we can possibly... You can't have one. It is God that openeth and closeth the womb. Ezekiel 37, 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them. And multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them. Forevermore. As we see, this concept of multiplication is a spiritual concept. Not merely a physical one. And then lastly, in the New Testament, in this same book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 14, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. There is no blessing of God apart from multiplication. It doesn't exist. Lastly, to clear up uh, one other misconception. Someone recently among us asked me, let's turn to Romans 9, 6 again. About Romans 9, 6, where it says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. This simply means that this great multiplication of people, there are Esau's mixed within them. There are tares among the wheat, but they are all God's people. We speak of the visible church and the invisible church. We speak of God's delivering the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, but not all the Israelites were finally saved. So the importance of the covenant. This great multitude of people that we pray God to give us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another time together. We thank Thee for Thy Word. We thank Thee for this concept, this progression of our understanding 
of justification. Deliverance from the guilt of sin through faith. Sanctification, deliverance from the power and pollution of sin. Present continuous, dying more and more in a sin, living more and more in a righteousness. This is all an understanding bringing about justification, an understanding of the law. Driving us to total despair into the Lord Jesus Christ's propitiation on our behalf. An understanding of the law. Reconciling us subjectively to obedience. And then thirdly, an understanding of the covenant. How thou dost produce thy people in the line of continued generations. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.